rallies, including those famously filmed by Lily Riefenstahl. You can climb and stand on the Grand Sabre. Yeah. She wasn't so up here. And so that would be right, Amy. This was the plan. See? Berlin.
The Reichstag and the dome. The Reichstag. Army above Berlin, especially on the roof of the Reichstag building, and it's signed by Alexandrov, which is the second name 
So it's very typical for what happened then, the occupation. And you can compare this with photos where you see the old interiors, the old the Italian style of the 19th century. Position and can change to the oh, perfect. We have to go up. Yeah. Okay. This is the benches of the government. You see the tall seat, the position of the chancellor. Yes. The uh, seat beside is the, uh, the seat of Westerwelle, the vice chancellor, foreign minister. And other seats are the other ministries. Okay. And we Westerwelle also have seats uh, which belong to the federal council. So the federal council has to uh, take part in the law decisions. Many laws have to pass both. Uh, uh, constitutional bodies and so they also have the right to speak and they can be present here if it is uh, decisions uh, when they are concerned and they have their own house at Leipziger Straße where they have to meet and where they have to uh, uh, make their votings and they represent the governments of the states of the uh, 16 states so it's three constitutional bodies but this is the parliament is the central mm -hmm. one uh, every law has to pass here and it can be brought in by the government, the parliament itself, or by the federal council. Mm. And not every law has to pass the federal council. At the ICC statute, we had to change our constitution, which is really one of them, a very historical event. And it was changed un... un, un oh, my English. Un, un, you know, uh, without any, any, any against votings. Oh, you know, well, that unanimous. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, I can remember. So, and then Whitney was there and Hans Peter was sitting there on the, on the government bench mm -hmm. behind our then foreign minister mm -hmm. and instructed him that today uh, one of the last surviving prosecutors is there with 90 some, some mm -hmm. years with his wife Anna. So there was a moment of silence and then the president of the parliament would, would stand up and say we have a very important occasion and we went through with this and we ratified it now, this very important law after Nuremberg and gave a little speech and we, we have somebody present who was one of the prosecutors in Nuremberg, Professor Whitney Harris and his wife Anna and uh, they stood up and then the entire parliament, everybody present gave them a long lasting standing ovation wow. so that was really wow. that was really and afterwards Whitney and Anna went with Hans Peter to the Hotel Adlon which is the place uh -huh. of, to celebrate it really oh, it was it oh, was they just wonderful. came for this one event Anna and Whitney oh, nice. and what year was that then when was that in 2004 Four. okay 2000, 2003 the court was established but when then we had to mm. change our mm. Constitution yeah. and it, it, it became now uh, it became part of our codex, wow. of our uh, judicial uh, thing that uh, we accepted the Statute of Rome. Oh, so that is really when, when the Rome uh, yeah, treaty yeah. was signed. First, we became a member, yes, yes. but not only a member. You have to ratify this as part of your uh, body of of right. your law. Whitney and Henry King went to the Rome. Yeah. 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 That is the worst thing to do this. We took down the Rome and we took down the Rome. This is the side of the wall here, it's the cobblestone. West Berlin, which was most of the Reichstag, but not all of it. Brandenburg Gate was in East Berlin. Thank you. 
I'm so Three years after the war, yeah. they were killed by, by some Russians who, who passed by. So, <laughs> oh but, but it's so full of history. Here you have now the new French embassy. Yeah. Very uh, contradicting opinions. <laughs> another, uh, another, another, another. Thank you. Another para tenerlo en aquí. Esto es como un cuadro de Escher. Berlin, wonderful, wet evening, great evening, with that crew right there. Very sort of iconic video of this place right after it was bombed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joseph Goebbels came here and said, We will rebuild, we will rebuild. Because this was the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. We're going to see this Berlin one way or the other. Brent clearing the path.
Waterfall. Maybe the highlight of the whole tour right here. Let's see if anybody gets out of this trench. Way to go, Pete. Congratulations. The German gun. You take it. It's getting wildly, all right. And where it all began, People's Court, Remember Trials. The front entrance. Of the People's Court. This was the beginning of the trial in 1945. Interesting picture because here we are. This is part of the picture. And then I finally picked it up and looked at it, and it was full zoomed in. So I'm still forgetting like nothing. Other side of the courthouse. Peterson and Ventus, right here. Peterson, Ventus. 
Lars Puppen spielen live. This is the Berlin Wall. Because Biography of Terror here. Oh, so this is where the terror houses were, right? Oh, I think it's a good one. I got this. Yeah, it's just amazing the parallels between this and the Israeli oh, wall. Yeah. So this side's east? That side's west? No, Checkpoint Charles, this is west. That's east. There is the wall. Think about what was, you know. Right out of a Hercule Perot novel. Watch yourself. Victor Martinez, who's now in the fold. Amy's happy? I am happy. Hopefully, I get this World Series win. Yeah, it's like 7 30. What's Grandma Pete doing? That's cute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These kids are going to be hungry.
adorable. See the air bubbles? Yeah. kind of cool to hang out. Two weeks ago, All right. uh, with his helpers, those guys. Yeah. Of course, you know how the story goes. <laughs> those are the ones who are supposed to buy everything. Right. Um, but what we do. Coincidence. Um, before that year, there was already a church here. It was a lot smaller, and it has been renovated and uh, enlarged many, many times throughout its history. Um, halfway there, 30, uh, 14th century, they thought it would be nice to have a tower as well. Church didn't have a tower, and what did they do? They 
filled in probably part of this canal. You can see that the canal is here much wider than it is over there. Mm -hmm. So probably they started constructing this tower upon a filled in part of the canal and that's why it started leaning right after the construction. <laughs> yeah, it's 75 meters high and it's leaning for almost two meters. And I must say that has worried a lot of citizens throughout the years. Um, some people thought it would collapse, especially the nuns who were living in the convent on the um, But it was really stormy whether they were always afraid that this tower would collapse. So they preferred to sleep on the other side of the convent there they were safe. Uh, halfway the 19th century they also had plans to break down this tower. And at the black parts they refer to the water in the canal and the white part refers to the banks. Mm. So it has everything to do with Delft and those black and white well, let's say colors are also the colors of the city of Delft. And we will see them on several public buildings. If you turn your head that way, you can see the spire of the new church and then you can mm. also see these black and white colors and we will see them also at the Prince's Court where we're going to. Um, Peter van Forees, yeah, he used to live here. He was the doctor of William of Orange and he was actually doctor in Alkmaar, to the north in, the, in the, the part Holland, the western part of the Netherlands. But in those days Delft was suffering with the plague, a very infectious disease. So they asked him to come to Delft and to advise the people of Delft what to do about it. You want to go to and then you have to take another bus or your bike. You are allowed to take your bike inside the yeah. train. They're folding bike and they put it in the train. And then, then when they come out, they can ride their bike again. Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, it's quite good. Because if you have to take your car, you have to bring a lot of money, otherwise you could forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, of course, they were also so powerful because they were so rich. And when William of Orange moved in here, the nuns had to move to that white building there behind you. It's called the Southern Wing. And the last nun died there about halfway the 17th century. But I just, I think a few months ago, I heard that the Dutch are not going to be any taller in the future, only fatter. So, oh, <laughs> well, he was one meter fifty-five high, um, so a real size statue. He was born in 1533, back in Dillenburg, which is nowadays in Germany. And he was a child of Lutheran parents um, when he was in part of France um, from his cousin and he was called René de Chalon but there was one condition to that and that was that he had to be raised Roman Catholic well William of Orange agreed with that so he was raised as a Roman Catholic boy at the court of Charles V which was in Brussels in those years and I must say that the relationship between William of Orange and Charles V was very good so soon he became one of the most important nobles here in Holland and in the beginning he could also get on with the son of Charles V Philip II very well they both loved partying and they both loved women <laughs> he was married four times so <laughs> well the whole situation changed actually when Philip II became the king of Spain and also was the one who rules over Holland. Well, Philip wanted that everyone in his empire was Roman Catholic. <laughs> well, you can imagine that William of Orange, as a child of Lutheran parents, was open to both religions. He didn't care whether his people were Roman Catholic or a Protestant or whatever, but Philips absolutely didn't want it. And furthermore, Philips said, I don't want the Dutch nobles to have a lot of influence. The situation had been completely different. They used to have a lot of influence. But because of the policies of Philips II, it all changed. And then another 10 years later, iconoclasm took place here in Holland. They went into the Roman Catholic churches, took out all the statues and the paintings. So I told you in the beginning was a city with city walls, so it could be defended. 
and furthermore he knew this place because he had come here several times and important guests were always accommodated in this rich and powerful convent so he knew this place already it was close to the Hague and he thought he would be safe here well the guards also knew that William of Orange was in their city so they knew that they had to do a very something moving outside the gates of Delft they are inventing why these holes are so low so close to the stairs so they actually wanted to open his coffin to measure the bones of William of Orange to know whether he was really 1 meter 55 high but our queen says no it's gonna stay close <laughs> well we have to do it with everything we know now it stays this way so they can't research that very well of course they needed to bury him somewhere and normally people were always buried in their family grave and his family grave was in the city of Breda it's in the southern part of Holland but that was still occupied by the Spanish in these years so that's why they buried him in the new church of Delft and from then on all the members of the Dutch royal family have been buried in well sometimes also reburied in this church so when our queen Beatrix she lives and works in The Hague. Mm -hmm. When she passes away one day, she'll be buried here inside this church. Her husband is already here, her parents as well. Oh. Wow. Santa Claus, the real Santa Claus, and his sidekicks. close to one of the canals of Delft. So he painted about 37 paintings, not that much, but he had 15 children, he was an art trader as well, so he was busy. Um, you see here this pregnant woman, his woman was pregnant of course many many years, but no one knows whether it is his wife or not. Um, unfortunately we don't have an original Vermeer here in Delft. They're spread all over the world. Um, I told you that Vermeer was very poor when he died. It was a disastrous time for Holland. It was the end of the Golden Age. We had a war with England and with France. So it was very, very difficult for the people living here uh, in those years. So he died really poor. And um, he actually, there was one person who had ordered a lot of his paintings called Peter van Ruyven. So uh, by his, um, well, his son in son-in-law had a lot of Vermeers when he passed away and then these Vermeers went to an auction and they were spread all over the world and they still are and towards the end of the 19th century a Frenchman wrote an article about Johannes Vermeer praising him for the light he used in his paintings and then there was a renewed interest in Vermeer so then people thought oh Vermeers they are nice and they are really worth a lot you know and so then there was a renewed interest actually shall we go to the market square um, wait, i have one question yeah. about vermeer didn't he use van lohenhoek's device to bring the light to when he painted no, you mean the so-called camera obscura yes, yes, yeah yes. yeah um there's a discussion going on about it they think they think no, no, no. Um, what did they knew each other well i don't know um, he did make uh, some painting of the
see you guys. Look at this. Two of Roches in front of the church where he's buried. <laughs> yes. Okay. Where we, where we, we, we don't want to get you in trouble. No, 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 no. We don't want to I don't want to show you. I don't want to show you. I don't want to show you. I don't want Take your picture? Oh, yes, there we go. How beautiful. You see why the judges enjoy you. Oh mm -hmm. my god, hello. Wait a minute, I want to show something. I was in the first page of the Nuremberg uh, Zontag uh, Blitz. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Really cool. And that's me, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, you, publicity, yes, good. <laughs> well, this is from the press conference yeah. that day. Yes. Oh, how fabulous. Oh, my God, I couldn't. <laughs> well, I was told the name John told me you are in the first page of the, the, the newspaper. And I said, What? Yes. No. And then I got to the reception and I said to the receptionist, I want to see these, of course, and these, and these, and these, and these, and all this. So it's not what I wanted to, yeah, to show it to you. Well, a lot of people mix the Nuremberg Trials mm -hmm. with the Nuremberg Trial, mm -hmm. the first one, the big one. So, the Nuremberg Trials are those uh, led by the Americans uh, under law uh, number 10, after the, Nure the big Nuremberg uh, uh, trial. And uh, so this includes, uh, for instance, the, the doctors, uh, the doctors' mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So it's very different from the big Nuremberg procedure that we were celebrating yeah, last mm -hmm. weekend. 
so then you have, uh, so I showed this to um, in my presentation, so I showed to everybody that there is the International Military Tribunal, then you have the Dark Tribunal that was more or less parallel, and then you have the four occupying countries had the authorization under law, control law 10, to start procedures in the occupied zones, so that's why you have the Nuremberg Military Trials, there are the American trials at Nuremberg, mm -hmm. that are not to mix up with the, the international uh, uh, military tribunal, then you have the English tribunals, the Russian tribunals, the tribunals, and you also had German tribunals and other tribunals, because a lot of people say, well, what happened to the soldiers? To uh, Well, they were tried uh, later. But yeah, this one is very... Because I saw already journalists asking me, uh, what about the doctor's uh, files if I have them? No, I have the IMT and Nuremberg archives, so of the big 24, against the 24, uh, finally only 20, 22 biggest uh, criminals. So this I explained the difference between the two. And then, uh, well, the content of our archives is ab around 200,000 uh, pages, and the Nuremberg archives, including the American trials, have around 1 million. So, wow. Wow. so when I tell some journalists that I have 260,000, also it's not complete because we know that it's more than one million. So, well, what is more than one million are the American uh, uh, trials and not uh, the, the international military trials. So you have gramophone discs, 1942 wow. uh, discs. That's amazing. Discs yeah. that are like this, they yeah. have 40, uh, mm -hmm. di uh, 40 centimeters diameter. They are read from the inside to the outside, around seven minutes per side. And they are in perfect state. Then we have artifacts, soaps, truncheons, and a piece of human skin. And then we have uh, 50 reels of film which uh, were projected as exhibits. So it's not the film of the trial itself, but it was the film yeah, that yeah. evidence. But I'm telling you, I think you know all this. It's just so this is the arrival at Nuremberg of the boxes. Uh, oh, at uh, the Hague, sorry. When did that happen? This happened in 1950 only. Amazingly, because uh, it was decided in 1946 by the tribunal itself, on a closed session on uh, the 1st of October, 46, that these uh, archives would come to the court. At that time, uh, the Permanent Court of International Justice, because we were still under the League of Nations, huh? the United oh, Nations was just coming. Yeah. And, but uh, there were uh, a lot of uh, negotiations between the four powers and uh, the court, especially because of uh, some logistic uh, and economic uh, financial uh, issues uh, because well of course these archives would uh, yeah imply certain costs and uh, of maintenance and etc and the court didn't want it to be under its uh, budget and so finally they agreed that in the possession of the intermediate tribune archives it's a language exercise I always say because are there other originals so in French il d'autres originaux are there other copies il d'autres copies are there other original copies? Excellent question, because <laughs> in English you can use the term uh, original copy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in French, because I see some French people say, oh no, there's only one original and several copies. You cannot have several original copies. So I have it. I said, no, no, no. no. It's a terminology problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are different sets. They might all be originals. We don't know. And one of the reasons we are digitizing everything is that we will be able to know exactly what we have and if other institutions have more. Because precisely in the four years, what happens with some documents or not? But what is important, and I really insist on saying that when I talk about this, is that the tribunal itself decided that it would be under our custody. So whatever there is around the world, the set that was decided as to be the set that would be the archives of that procedure was the set given to the court in the last decades. Huh? As I mentioned in one of the press conferences as well, after the war, attention was concentrated on the Cold War. These archives were not, yeah, it, everything was very fresh. Nobody cared about that the archives would exist and last. But, uh, and also in the 1950s, nobody talked about preservation. It was not a problem, preservation, not preservation, or, uh, well, this is oh, documents, you, have, you know that the paper document 70% is published, huh? 70%. Can you go back for a second? Brent didn't get a chance he to see it. He see that, no. of course. Here, there, oh. yeah, perfect. That's the real deal. The judgment. Oh. Yeah. The sentence, actually. The judgment oh. is 300 pages. Yeah. And, um, 
So you have the imprisonment for life that by hanging blah blah. And then yep. well, you know that um, there there is this enormous collection of forty two volumes uh, that are published. So and we found out here uh, with the requests we received from outsiders that I calculate, this is my calculation, that around approximately seventy percent of the entire archives have been published, but not everything. And when you see the publishers forward in volume, you say you see a sense of seventy percent. They were in a cover like this when I arrived. You know, the inventors. This is the company I uh, I, fi I fired. I hired <laughs> <laughs> to uh, yeah to prepare the documents for the moving for them to be acidified. So this was. Uh, the what is that process? I'll you show you. Oh. Incredible, wonderful. This is me at the day on the track <laughs> because people here for thirty years said this would never happen. Oh yeah, it happens. Look at me. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so, the acidification process. Cool. So before the treatments, we, we measured the acidification of the papers. They, the pH was between 3.2 and 5.8. As you know, pH 7 is the neutral uh, uh, pH level. So, less than 7 is too acid, more than 7 is too alkaline. So after treatments, and I'll show you how it, uh, the, the treatment went on, you have a minimum of pH 7 and a little bit more, around 8.5, just in case yeah, uh, time makes something. Although from now on, these papers are going to be under 18 degrees Celsius and 40% of humidity. That is the general advice for keeping paper. Uh, but we have to acidify it before putting them in the right temperature. So, what is the desertification process? Well, it's a very uh, mysterious uh, mixture that is made of magnesium oxide with a non-toxic fluorinated liquid. When I saw the liquid, I saw the papers in the liquid. I would have and I said, oh, yeah. what are you doing? You're washing my papers? I almost have a price. It was not water. It's liquid, but it's not water. So it's this non-toxic fluorinated liquid. So this together creates an alkaline buffer into the structure of the paper. Then, once this uh, is out of the, the treatment, it mixes with uh, normal moisture of the air, so it will be 40% in the ideal uh, condition, and then it even uh, becomes another uh, element, so magnesium hydroxide, and will continuously neutralize acids in the future. And look at this, these are the machines where the papers were treated, and these are the papers inside the washing thing, and wow. I almost uh, so had a crisis. <laughs> is it just a stack of them, or how do they put them in? She yeah, she they put them in, in, in the batches. Mm -hmm. the batches. batches. Yeah, yeah. Did the and paper then have a higher rag content or cotton content than paper does now? What's, uh, uh, oh, it was very bad quality. So it's very bad quality. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays. Uh, by the way, thanks to this, because I gave a conference about this, as I said to you, why they changed the first chase of papers there. Because they were pay, buy, buying paper very cheap. A wonderful technology in Switzerland, state of the art. I negotiated the price. I broke the price in two of a procedure that will extract the sounds of the disc without touching the discs. Wow. Because the other company was proposing to use a diamond to, uh, with a little old machine and put one by one, etc. But this had the risk of uh, disturbing the, the, the structure of the disc. And I found out of technology that's just wonderful. It is uh, called the visual audio technique. It's an optical retrieval and storage of uh, the sounds. So our original records uh, is put uh, into a machine where a high uh, resolution photography is taken. What? Megapixels? Huh? How many megapixels? Ah, good question. I wouldn't know by heart, but uh, yeah, oh, wow. I can send you later. Uh, yeah. But I'll show you the, 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 the machine because it's really incredible. So there is a scan film. Then a scanner reads the picture. Amazing. Very cool. And here is a Jackson. Um, That's amazing. And unfortunately, I cannot play it here because my machine of the court doesn't. Yeah. Of course, it That's doesn't okay. work for these kind of things. 
So then what audio file is considered archive worthy? Hmm? What, uh, what medium is then considered archive worthy for storing sound? Ah, this is a very excellent uh, question because uh, there, are, there are two issues inside the, your, your question. Is, uh, you have uh, the uh, media for uh, archival um, purposes mm -hmm. and then you have uh, the media for preservation. Uh, no, sorry. You have the media for preservation purposes. Okay. So, it's for so I'm a film guy. Careful guy, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Thank uh, you. Okay. And then you have, well, there are 50 reels of films. The original films were, 37 of the reels uh, were, uh, the films were on nitrate base, 13 uh, were on acetate base. In 1989, this was the first preservation procedure that was ever done about these archives. A copy of nitrate base to acetate base was made because nitrates today is known to be self uh, inflaming. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be kept in 18 cell. Well, uh, the, the films are a little bit lower, right? the temperature is 12 uh, degrees, and then a database, and the metadata that they're going to build, blah blah, 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 blah. the legacy, archival lessons, legal lessons. Blah blah and blah blah. Well, now I'll show you very quickly just my uh, thank you. Wonderful. My, no, but please, please. Ah, this is Buddha because I've been to Nepal and I adore this uh, stupa. Um, what's that again? Yeah, I want to show you my plan because my plan is beautiful. Uh, Nuremberg, New York. Uh, 